begin. Welcome back, everyone. And before we start the second debate, I'd like to remind you all of the motion again. And the motion is that this House believes that historic debt between Commonwealth countries should be written off. So, I would now like to call on Sean Cosgrove from Trinity High to open the second debate as the first proposition speaker. Sean, you have six minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, Honoured Judges, Fellow Debaters. My name is Sean Cosgrove and tonight, as a proposition alongside my colleague David Campbell, I will be arguing strongly in favour of the motion this House believes that historic debt between Commonwealth countries should be written off. The purpose of our arguments this evening is to articulate three main points. Firstly, the moral case for cancelling the debt, which I shall express. My colleague David will then go on to discuss the economic case for cancellation, and together these will form a combined approach to the issue, both the heart and the head of the argument. We, as the proposition, would define this evening's motion as cancelling all unsustainable debt accumulated over a number of years. Unsustainable debt would be debt over and above an amount that would severely limit the ability of a nation to function if it is continued to be paid. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to open my arguments by briefly summarising the effects unsustainable debt has upon poorer Commonwealth countries. Mr Speaker, so members of the House, I'd just like to point out that the motion is this House believes that historic debt, not unsustainable historic debt, should be written off. Yes, the, the motion does say that, but we define it as unsustainable debt as this is a debt that should be written off first and foremost, as sustainable debt can obviously, as it suggests, be sustained, whereas unsustainable debt leads to problems for countries, as I shall go on to discuss. Every year, through the many charity campaigns we see on television, we glimpse the suffering developing Commonwealth nations undergo partially due to the effects of debt. The key to economic development in the 21st century is a healthy, well-educated workforce, something that requires well-funded social care to materialise. As a result of unsustainable debt, this money isn't available to many nations within the Commonwealth that are developing. In 1997, Zambia spent 40% of its total budget servicing its foreign debt. As a result, health and education received less than 8%. So, members of the House, last year Zambia also managed to spend a whole 1% of its budget on lavishly hosting a summit for African unity. Admittedly, some expenses from African budgets may seem frivolous compared to health and education and debt, but we're focusing on the effects that the debt has, not other spending. The reality is that debt is a millstone around the necks of developing Commonwealth countries. Whilst they're indebted, they simply cannot move forward. This leads on to the first part of the moral case in favour of debt cancellation. The morality of this debt can be questioned by first examining who in fact took receipts of, of the loans that has led to this debt. Countries and transnational banks have been happy to loan money to developing Commonwealth nations since they first emerged during the last century. Unfortunately, many of these developing members of the Commonwealth, primarily those within Africa, have suffered under dictators and juntas. The debts amassed via the, the militarisation and brutal oppression of these dictators are now outrageously being paid back by their victims. The great freedom fighter and statesman... Uh, speaker, sir, members of the House, if you make regime change a valid reason for debt cancellation, this will surely promote instability and revolutions, violence within countries. We're not suggesting current regime change. This is historic debt. These are previous regimes that are no longer in existence, as I will go on to show through one of my examples. The great freedom fighter and statesman Nelson Mandela finally won freedom for black South Africans in 1994 with his election as president. And how was he rewarded? He was duly presented with a bill for $21 billion, the debt of, of the apartheid government which had imprisoned him. And with the white minority government gone, it was left to their victims, the black South Africans, to pay back. £29 billion has already been spent by South Africa servicing its foreign debts. All the while, creditors like the IMF have demanded the privatisation of essential services such as electricity and healthcare, thus denying it to millions of South African citizens. 
Nobel Prize winner Adolfo Perez Esquivel once said, transnational banks know the price of everything, but have no values. How is it right that debts incurred by brutal dictators are demanded back from the pockets of their very victims? Debt campaigners argue that such odious debt should be cancelled, not for the economic reasons that my colleague Dave will go on to discuss, but as a matter of social justice. The moral reasons for debt cancellation are extended by examining its effects on human rights. The Commonwealth Charter sets out a commitment for its members to defend the human, civil and social rights of their citizens. As a result of unsustainable debt, developing Commonwealth countries like Zambia and Rwanda cannot perform this task. One minute. They are unable to meet the basic rights of their people, like access to education and health, because they simply cannot afford it because they are paying back such unsustainable levels of debt. As a result of their demands for repayments, Commonwealth creditors, like the United Kingdom, are complicit in the suffering of these people. By demanding ever-rising and more ridiculous repayments from developing Commonwealth nations, we deny them the ability to provide for their people, then we chastise them for failing to do so. Britain, and indeed all other developed Commonwealth nations, must take a long, hard look at themselves. We are supposed to be the leading lights of this organisation. Other members look to us as an example. What example, I ask you, are we setting them by draining their budgets and denying them the opportunity to care for themselves? Ladies and gentlemen, so far you have heard the moral case for debt cancellation, the heart of the argument. The fact is, demanding billions of pounds in debt repayments is wrong, plain and simple. Now, please. It increases the suffering of people in underdeveloped Commonwealth nations. It adds insult to injury for the victims of oppression. It denies people the basics of human dignity. For these reasons, and all others I have expressed, I urge you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And I would now like to ask Robert Wilson from Glenalmond College to respond as the first opposition speaker. Robert, you have six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, Sir, Members of the House, today I will put forward to you as the first speaker for the opposition why we believe that historic debt between Commonwealth countries should not be written off. I will present two main points. Firstly, it would be better to encourage courage countries to sustainably develop towards paying off debt. And secondly, cancelling all debt would not actually resolve any long-term problems. However, first I would like to make a rebuttal. Surely if we wanted to take the moral high ground here and help these countries develop, surely it would make more sense to help them through aid projects rather than just wasting money from our uh, aid budget in debt relief. Many poor countries within the Commonwealth of Nations do indeed have huge debts to wealthier countries. There is no denying that. However, there are far better ways of helping to reduce global inequalities and encourage development than to just write off all their debt. Perhaps it would be sensible to cancel some debt to a more manageable level, but to simply cancel all debt would be foolish and does not resolve the problems which caused the debt in the first place. No, thank you. What we need to do is encourage sustainable development. Through development projects and other methods, we can help develop these less wealthy countries sustainably and help to reduce global inequality. Aid can and has been used to help develop communities and even nations sustainably. Through large-scale projects such as hydroelectric dams, we can help areas become self-sustaining and less reliant on other countries for things such as energy. For example, a number of projects have taken place across Western Africa. These projects include a 102 megawatt hydropower dam at Fomi in Guinea, a 25 megawatt plant in Tusa, Mali, and the 565 megawatt dam in Niger. These aim to boost hydroelectricity and air irrigation, reduce desertification and flooding, and improve economic activities across the region. Uh, yes, please. Would you not agree that it would be better to allow these countries to help themselves rather than having them rely on us to provide them with aid to build such things as, as you've mentioned, hydroelectric dams? Well, at the current point, they cannot help themselves. We need to help fund them so that they are less reliant on the future. That is the point of developing them. Through methods like this, we can create more sustainable economies and communities. Many countries lose vast quantities to political problems like corruption. Surely it would be more sensible to encourage poorer countries to tackle problems like this and create more efficient and successful economies than to just let them off their debt without resolving this problem. 
Partial abolition of debt may contribute to this. However, in cancelling all debt, we would leave little reason for these countries to need to change, and we have not actually aided their development. Uh, no, thank you. We need to help these countries develop in a sustainable way and to help them pay off the debts themselves. Cancelling debt does not resolve real problems. Furthermore, writing this debt off will not actually resolve any underlying problems. If we cancelled all debt between Commonwealth countries, sure, the poor countries would be less affected by costs of debt right now. But 20, 30 years down the line, we will most likely encounter the exact same problem. Cancelling all of this debt would not actually resolve any of its causes. Much of this debt originated from poor countries, recklessly learning money from wealthier countries, and what's to stop this happening again? Do we really want to create a never-ending spiral of debt abolition? Yes, please. You talked about the odious debt that was built up, so surely with many of these regimes now downfalling, surely that countries would now be in a position to pay back that debt and not get in the problems they were before? Well, when cancelling their debt, like I will go on to say, it's just creating more space for dubious lending at higher interest rates. So we can cancel off now, but the exact same thing will just happen 20 or 30 years down the line. Ghana, for example, has used the space created by debt relief from the HIPC scheme to borrow more money from international on the international markets at interest rates 10 times higher than institutions like the World Bank and African Development Bank. In doing this, we would be merely encouraging poorer countries to squander the money they are lent, safe in the knowledge they will never have to pay it back. Besides, some wealthier countries have struggling economies too, and if they constantly lend money and are never paid it back, this could have a dire impact on their long-term economy. One of the aims of the Commonwealth is to help reduce global inequality. Perhaps this might resolve some of the basic problems of economic inequalities for now, but other social and political inequalities and underlying economic issues are not actually being addressed at all. In failing to resolve these problems, we are not actually helping the people of the country. Cancelling debt doesn't resolve political unrest, it doesn't reduce crime, and it doesn't stop countries recklessly destroying their rainforests in order to generate wealth. You might believe that these problems cannot be addressed until One after minute. the debt is cancelled. However, we believe that we can cancel a portion of the debt between countries in order to allow breathing space to help resolve these problems and develop the countries sustainably. In order to resolve global, global economic inequalities, poorer countries need to become less dependent on wealthier countries, and writing off all their debt does not achieve this. Many countries in the Commonwealth do have serious problems due to the debt they are currently unable to pay off. There is no denying this. However, writing off 100% of their debt is not the right solution. As I have mentioned today, there are better ways of resolving these debts, and that writing them off does not actually deal with the causes. We are not saying that we cannot write off some debt to countries to help them, but for all the reasons I have put forward, and my partner will go on to put forward, to cancel all debt would be reckless and wrong. Thank you. And thank you, Robert. And I now invite David Campbell, who is the second proposition speaker, to give us his views. David, you have six minutes, please. Deputy President Officer, Honoured Judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Campbell, and as Sean has already said, we, the proposition, believe the historic debt between Commonwealth countries should be written off. Sean has already gave you the heart of the argument, the moral case. But what we're going to talk about is how writing off this debt would economically help developing nations within the Commonwealth and also us here in the UK. But first, let me offer some points of rebuttal. The opposition argued that with eradicating this debt, the exact same situation would eventually come up 20 or 30 years down the line in these developing nations. But as Sean has already said, many of these situations were brought up by odious debt, built up by dictators. So these new, untested regimes may not necessarily encounter the same problems. Ladies and gentlemen, developing nations within the Commonwealth have a hole in their bucket. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that these nations pay nine times more back to bigger nations in terms of debt relief than they receive in grants per year. In a more simplistic One argument, minute. in 2013, Comet Relief raised roughly £75 million to help out in humanitarian projects in developing nations throughout the world. However, developing countries in the Commonwealth pay this back in three days in the form of debt repayment to the West. Debt is crippling to the economies of these countries. It is crippling to the people of these nations in terms of keep keeping them impoverished. 
And it's bad to the trade opportunities of these countries. And why do I mention trade? Well, trade is the way. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Members of the House, in several poor Commonwealth countries, less than 5% of their debt burden is to other Commonwealth countries, and over 50% is to countries such as China. Yes, but I want to talk about how the significant relief of debt to the Commonwealth would actually help the situation in these nations. I mentioned trade, and why did I talk about trade? Well, trade is the way that India, South Africa and Brazil have managed to climb their way up in the global financial ladder. Trade is a way to lift yourself out of a dire economic situation. But right now, the situation of these countries is too bad to do so because they get themselves in a vicious cycle of debt. To make more money, countries need to increase their exports. And due to demands of the developed nations, oversaturation of markets occurs and countries' financial situation worsens, which puts them in a vicious cycle that means they are unable to get out of this debt on their own. Um, no, thank you. The main thing that the adequation of debt would do is make these countries more attractive trading partners. And the benefits of this are unlistable, but I'm going to name a few. It would help reduce the cost of their inputs. It would help them acquire finance through investments. It would help increase the variety, volume and value of their products and overall help them climb up in the global financial ladder. God, that's a mouthful. Accepted. Thank you, sir, members of the House. Debt is a symptom of far greater problems like inadequate infrastructure and institutions, and simply cancelling the debt is not going to make it more attractive for foreign investors. But as I'm going to say, it's a start. It's a start to make it possible to focus on these institutions rather than having to focus on paying back money that they can't afford to pay back. It's a start to allow them to focus on improving stuff like health and education rather than focusing on money they can't really afford to pay to develop nations. However, let's look what this motion would do for the financial situation in the UK. In an era where the Eurozone GDP is flatlining, Commonwealth growth is at an average of 3% per year. And in some of the developed nations within the Commonwealth, such as India, this growth is at 5%. To do away with the eradication of debt could see a re-engagement of British trade and industry with the rest of the world, particularly the Commonwealth who already share a rich history and relationship with. In 2011, William Hague was stated to saying the Commonwealth could become a leading voice in the global economy, working to liberalise trade and break down barriers for international markets. Now, what this says to me, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are looking to the East like we haven't done in 30 years. But where does the eradication of debt come into solving Britain's own economic and trade problems? Well, as I've mentioned, many developing nations within the Commonwealth would benefit from this motion. Countries such as Zambia, countries such as Kenya, could be potential trade partners in the future because they are allowed to focus on improving their infrastructure and improving their economic systems, which creates genuine two-way trade between us and them that's not only good for the developing nations, but it's also good for us in these uncertain financial times. Accepted? The Commonwealth already is a highly lucrative um, organisation. That's why countries such as Mozambique and Rwanda, with no historic links to Britain, have asked to join it. Yes, they've asked to join it, but what I am looking to do is exploit the current situation and improve on it especially in the current uncertain financial times for the UK and nations. Because what it would also do for the UK is give increased trade opportunities with the bigger nations within the Commonwealth, increased trade opportunities with the likes of India, Singapore, New Zealand and One Canada. Minute. But we also need to look at what it would do for the bigger nations in the Commonwealth as well, such as Australia, who is suffering some debt crises at the moment. This would help bolster their economy and create a potential giant of a trade partner for us back here. Ladies and gentlemen, I see three main things that eradication of debt would do. It would help relieve nations of debt which has been a burden for generations. It would help relieve nations of change which have stopped them being viable trade partners in the past. And it's helped relieve nations of financial situations that have stopped their growth and grossly affected the populations of these countries. Getting rid of unsustainable debt can only be positive because that's what we've defined the motion as unsustainable debt. We're not looking at a closing down sale of all debt in the Commonwealth. It's not a next superstore. Sean gave the heart of the argument. I have gave the common sense an eco economically sensible argument. What we need to do is patch the hole in the bucket of these developing nations. We need to give more certainty to the economy of Britain in the future. You must we need to stimulate now, trade in the Commonwealth. We need to bolster economies in the Commonwealth. And we need to create better lives in the Commonwealth. And that is why I urge you to accept the motion proposed here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert.
And I now invite David Campbell, second proposition speaker, to give us... Sorry, I beg your pardon. We move to here. Oh, sorry. Thank you, David. I now invite Izzy Arno, second opposition speaker, to speak. Izzy, you have six minutes. My apologies. Mr Speaker, sir, members of the House, I shall conclude the case for the opposition with two arguments. First, the repercussions of across-the-board debt cancellation, and second, development of my partner's point that debt cancellation is ineffective. Firstly, <laughs> I'd like to restate my point that the motion does not specify um, unsustainable historic debt, but even if the proposition decided to define it so, uh, the World Bank defines unsustainable historic debt at that above 65% of GDP. This includes Britain. Our debt is 90% of our GDP, and also Singapore, which is the richest country in the Commonwealth, whose debt is 110% of our GDP. And it seems to me nonsensical to want to cancel off these debts, which are also defined as unsustainable. Um, I'd also like to reinforce a point which I made as a point of information, that m the majority of debts, over 50% of debt, is not from Commonwealth countries, it's from China and other, um, also other institutions such as the World Bank, which this motion doesn't cover, and it would seem much more sensible to have a needs basis approach focusing on these kinds of debts rather than the tiny proportion of Commonwealth debt. To my first point, the proposition assumes that writing off debt between Commonwealth countries means poor nations will get more money, but this is simplistic and flawed. It doesn't take into account the complex composition of debt. They propose to write off bilateral, that is, government-to-government -government debt, between Commonwealth countries, but are forgetting debts to non-Commonwealth countries, multilateral organisations and private creditors. The proportion of these different kinds of debts vary hugely between countries. 80% of Samoa's debt is to multilateral institutions, and bilateral Commonwealth debts make up less than 5%. Cancellation of this 5% is not going to have much impact. Only Tonga and Mauritius have bilateral debt nearer 50%. But this isn't fair. The Commonwealth's core value is equality, and this motion would have such an uneven impact that it would undermine this principle. Approaching the issue on a needs basis would be much more equitable. Yes, thank you. Would you not agree that by cancelling the unsustainable Commonwealth debt, it could lead to a start, as David has mentioned, of other debts cancelling? Surely that by cancelling one, much. we could leave to others? But by putting all this effort and resources into cancelling 5% of Kenya's debt and then maybe 30% of Singapore's or other countries with unsustainable debt burdens, um, it would be much more sensible to continue the work of the Commonwealth Development Initiative, which works with the World Bank and the IMF already to sustainably manage Commonwealth debt. As I just said, debt management needs to be tailored and not a one-size-fits-all one and hope for the best. Moreover, the poorest nations will benefit least from this Commonwealth debt because they have the highest proportion of Chinese loans. Over 50% of Kenya's debt is to China and Japan alone. And this would focus on a tiny proportion of the problem, just cancelling Commonwealth debt. Further, it would be a catastrophe for countries that both borrow and lend. To simplify, think of a person who rents out his flat. He relies on his tenant's rent to pay his mortgage, but if they don't have to pay their rent anymore, how is he going to pay his mortgage? Say Australia has lent to India or any other Commonwealth country which happens to have unsustainable debt and borrowed from a non-Commonwealth country like China. The proposition would cancel the Commonwealth debts owed to it, um, which would then leave it unable to repay its non-Commonwealth creditors. Because bilateral borrowing is so interlinked and global, the proposition's ill-conceived meddling would have consequences around the globe. We need to target the few that would benefit from debt relief by continuing the work of the Commonwealth Debt Initiative, which supports countries to manage their debt. Yes, please. Would you not agree that cancelling some of this debt between Commonwealth nations would serve as a start? for these nations to lift themselves out of the tough economic times that they're going through. Thank you. It's a very inefficient way to start. A more, as I said, a needs-based approach, a tailored look. I do agree that debt is a serious problem and more needs to be done. We need to put more effort and resources into the debt management schemes that already exist and make them more effective than cancelling um, a one-size-fits-all across-the-board debt cancellation without looking into the individual needs of each country. To my second point, the proposition are right. Poverty is unjust and it has to change. We want to blame something and debt is a highly visible target, but I must reinforce my partner's point. Writing off debt does not solve underlying problems and will not help the poor. 
Cornell University Professor of Economics Christopher Barrett agrees, saying categorically, debt cancellation does not reduce poverty. It's not debt which prevents poor governments from doing simple, inexpensive things to improve lives of the poor. Pakistan, Pakistan's disease problems arise from the government's unwillingness to spend money on the rural poor rather than their nuclear weapons programme. Take Nigeria. Vast oil reserves, a space programme, pays its legislators the highest salaries in the world, yet 70% of its population live in poverty. Since 1960, they've received £257 billion pounds of aid, 245 of which is estimated to have been stolen. Debt cancellation feeds this corruption and won't help the poor. Um, it's the lack of basic infrastructure that we need to change in order to allow growth. Roads, education, property rights, access to credit markets. Um, without addressing these problems, debt cancellation is only a short-term measure, throwing good money after bad. Um, it distracts from the infrastructural problems we should be tackling. A report from Stanford of University used the comparison of offering a plaster when bones are broken and radical surgery is required. Targeted aid is the best way to tackle poor infrastructure and promote growth. A fresh start must come at a time when a country is best able to use it. The proposition are putting the cart of debt cancellation before the horse of infrastructure development. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, members of the up, House, please. to conclude, I've shown that writing off debt between Commonwealth countries is unequal, will generate economic problems and will not help the poor because the causes of poverty have not been addressed. So, Mr Speaker, sir, members of the House, for these overwhelming reasons, vote opposition. Thank you very much, Lizzie. And also a big vote of thanks to all our speakers in this debate. Once again, please, a vote of thanks. So, I'm now going to open this debate as before to the floor, and we would like to invite again everyone to participate. As before, the floor debate will last for 15 minutes, and can I again ask you to please raise your points in relation to the debate, and if you wish to speak, please raise your hand. And if selected, you should wait for the red light to come on on your microphone. Stand and tell the chamber your name and the name of your school before you make your point. If you can give short speeches or ask questions, that would be helpful. And I'd like to remind you that the teams can choose to answer the point, but their performance is not judged against their response, or teams can choose not to answer. You may decide to concentrate on constructing your reply speech, which is marked. I would like, if I may, to take upon myself to invite people who haven't been asked to speak before um, to put their hands up first uh, so that everyone gets an equal chance to have something to say. And once we've got through that group of people, then I'll open it up again and allow people to perhaps speak for a second time. OK, uh, young man over here. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd first like to talk about a bit about morality and address the opposition. You talked about how to have the moral eye... Your name and school, please. Oh, sorry. Um, Alistair Boyer, Craigmont High School. So you talked about how to have the moral high ground, you have to provide aid. But first of all, surely to, to have the moral high ground, you have to look at the bad things you've done and then realise that they're, they're bad and then put a stop to them. You can provide aid to a country and also cancel historic debt. They are not mutually exclusive. Um, you also talked about the causes of this debt. But the main thing that causes these debt in the first place is these countries exploiting them. Because they didn't say, oh, here's money to help, you need to pay it back. They say, here's money to help, you need to pay more than that back. Because they're actually paying off more than what they were given. Which is why we see it so immoral. Um, by actually cancelling off, cancelling all this debt, you're giving these countries a chance to actually invest in the things that they can't currently because they are having to put it into it and you're giving them a chance to solve the problems themselves. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Robert. Um, we're not saying that uh, we feel, well, we're not saying that what we did before was good. We're saying that we should certainly right our wrongs. Nor are we saying that debt itself is good. We think that we should cancel some debt. We think that the motion is not the right way to go about sorting the problem, and that aid and partial, and as my and said focused uh, debt abolition would be much more effective. 
Thank you. Young lady up here in the middle with the dark hair. Emily Tang from Emily Tang from Douglas Academy. I'd like to ask if unsustainable debt is written off, debt often caused by corrupt leaders, how are countries going to going to sustain any long term solution? Where is the line going to be drawn on the needs of a country and how many chances can a country be given because there will continue to be a vicious cycle of debt? By having a solution where countries are encouraged to pay off this debt, countries will have an incentive to maintain or strive for a sustainable economy and to improve their governing systems. Thanks. Thank you. Other side, far corner at the top, young lady. Uh, Chloe Lindsay of Trinity High School. My question for the opposition is, what other ways are there to help these, the economies of these countries and other than to remove the debt, which is strangling them and preventing them from making the transition from developing countries to developed countries? Uh, well, like I mentioned, there are much better methods uh, through aid development, like, like I said, the hydroelectric dams that are taking place across Western Africa. These are much more sustainable than just cancelling all the debt, which doesn't resolve the problems. Thank you. Young lady in the blue top and the middle at the back. Um, Mary Harvey Crawford from Glen Armand College. Um, not all indebted countries are led by dictators or were led by dictators when they made the loans. So why is it ridiculous for them to pay off a loan that they owe? And why don't you just extend the deadlines from the ones which were run by dictators at the time? Thank you very much. Um, what? Did you want to respond? Uh, yes, please, uh, Sean. Uh, um, David we Emmett. would accept that not all debt amassed was by dictators, and you're right, not all these countries are currently or were led by dictators, but we focused on that point as we felt that was truly the most outrageous statistic that these, country, these people of these countries who suffered are being forced to pay it back. You know, much of this debt was amassed 50, 60 years ago, so there has been a very long deadline and they still haven't paid it back. If they haven't paid it back by now, they never are. So we're better to cancel it than rather force them to suffer through poverty for many more years trying to pay back debts that they simply can't pay back. Many thanks. A young lady in blue there in the right-hand side. Yes. Well done. My name's Emily Wilson from Dumblain High School. Um, this is for the proposition team. I would like to draw attention to the possibility that by constantly relieving countries of their debt, they will feel assured that they will always be relieved of it. Thus meaning it is of no consequences to them if they spend their money inappropriately. Thank you. Side, uh, young lady with dark hair. Karumi Marie Connolly, Trinity High School. Would a solution to the problem be conditions to debt relief to ensure countries' development? And could this not be seen as a form of aid? Um, do you want to respond? No, right. Um, young man up here in the middle with hand up. Yes, second from the back. Duncan Bowyer, Craigmont High School. I'd like to ask the opposition how they think aid really works. Because the thing is, most aid that countries give is tied aid. In other words, the country is expected to pay it back when the investment from this aid um, comes through. So really, any source of aid, as they've already talked about, you know, countries owe a lot of money to multinational companies. The only true source of of aid and investment to a, to a developing country that doesn't ultimately hinder them later to some extent is investment directly from the government of that country. And the, the, we, we've seen from the proposition that the clearest way to give this, this government more resources to invest in its economy is to reduce its debt burden by cancelling its Commonwealth debt. Thanks. A young lady here in the middle. Thank you. Gentlemen, my name's Robin Baker and I'm from Craigmont High School. I would like to raise a point that debt cancellation, I don't understand how this is not helping them in any way, shape or form. I believe that when we are cancelling this debt, we are giving them, and in the famous words of Pastor Musical, a chance to start something new. I would like to also say that debt is like an attempted murderer, they, and the developing countries are like victims. Without the stop of the murder, they can't move forward. They can't have something to be great potential. They can't do what they need to do to help themselves. Sure, some, you might say, dictators are like two-year-olds not knowing what to do with this money. But when, they get, when they've been in power for longer, they learn and they learn and they know more about everything that they're doing. And this is why I said we should move the motion. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, young lady beside you. Christina Gordon from Craigmount High School. This debate is riding on the topic of historic debt, and we see that this debt was made by our ancestors and has little to do with the people of 2014. So why is it the people of 2014 who are feeling the consequences, especially in the less developed countries? We don't punish modern Germany for the historic actions of Hitler, so why do we punish our Commonwealth neighbours by inflicting large debt with high interest on them when it was the actions of their previous historic leaders? Many thanks. Izzy wants to respond. Um, uh, yes, well, that's because it's not, we are not really inflicting large debt on them. As I said quite frequently, in many of the traditional um, colonial countries that are considered poorest, like Zambia, Kenya, um, ones such as these, um, bilateral debt between Commonwealth countries is actually less than 5%, and it's you know, 50% to China, 20% to Japan, and the rest is to the World Bank. So, you know, it's, it's not, the fault is not all with us. The proposition tried to lay the blame on us, but really, the majority of it's China, and this Commonwealth motion is not going to help that. Thank you. Right, young man over here on the left. Um, Samuel Milne from Douglas Academy. Just, this is for the proposition. Just to expand on something the opposition said, but I don't think you answered quite clearly. The whole reason why countries require aid is because they cannot afford to pay for things like education and healthcare. And we are not aiding these countries, as first opposition said. Our donations have been used recklessly and leave them confident they do not have to pay these debts back. Ergo, we are not aiding these countries economically or socially. So I ask you to answer this. By removing this debt, how can you ensure that this doesn't happen again in years to come? And how can you ensure this donated money will be spent on the basic necessities, such as healthcare and education. Thank you. Um, yes, Sean. So by removing the debt, we're giving these countries a chance to keep this money within their own borders and spend it on health and education as they see fit, without having to take aid money from the developed world. If we reduce the need for aid money, we can reduce the likelihood that it will be spent on things that it's not targeted for. By allowing these countries to target the money themselves, they learn how to develop themselves and they learn how to not make the mistakes they've made with the aid we've given them. They learn how to properly handle their money and how to develop. Many thanks. Hi, young man up there on the black top on the right hand side in the middle. Alexander McLaren, St Mary's Music School. Um, I was wondering if I could continue the discussion about morality. It seems to me that the, um, the main moral issue we've discussed so far is that of social injustice. And when connected to debt, I was wondering, wondering if I could put it to the proposition that um, at, the, at the end of your first speech, you said that, that debt was wrong. And if you could link that to the very coherent point that the, uh, the opposition made at the end of their speech, that um, the cancellation of debt is not necessarily causal to the rectification of poverty. Sean? Well, I'd accept that cancelling the debt wouldn't lead to immediate changes with poverty, but as I've already said, it would give them the chance to keep the money and use it over time to solve these problems. We're not expecting overnight cancel Zambia's debt and they'll all be happiness and sunshine. Nobody will put, be put in Zambia. It will take time, but by allowing these people, the countries, to keep the money in their own borders and use it to spend on their people, we are tackling social injustice, but it will take time. It won't happen overnight. Young lady in blue at the right hand of the three ladies, three girls. Yeah, yes, you. Yeah, um, my name is Maya Nicol and I'm from Dumbling High. My question is directed towards the opposition and regards the morality of making those already in poverty pay back such a large amount of money, uh, driving them only further into a seemingly never-ending um, spiral. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, young man up there on the white shirt on the far right hand side. Uh, Connor McCann from Trinity High School. Uh, this is to the opposition about when they said only cutting some of the debt, but surely writing off some of the debt would only bring the negative effects of cutting debt, such as um, dis disencouraging foreign investors, but wouldn't give the full benefit of not having to pay back debt, so therefore not fixing the problem, but only changing it. Uh, Izzy, briefly, please. What we are arguing for is continuation and support of the Commonwealth Debt uh, Management Initiative, in which writing off some levels of debt where it really is 
properly unsustainable at Caribbean countries where it's over 100 per cent. They do consider that as an option, but they work really hard to try and negotiate debt buybacks and swaps and massaging interest rates down so they can manage it without getting the bad credit rating of having their debt written off. Thanks very much. Young lady at the back on the left, please. Um, my name is Hannah Bernard from Douglas Academy. Um, the proposition said that unsustainable debt will, present, will prevent countries developing and cripple our economy. However, debt relief is just feeding money into the corrupt governments which have led them into this um, corruption and have crippled our economy. I believe that we are just in, in pr promoting them, punishing their citizens. We must reinstate the fundamental principle that the Commonwealth stands for, which is equality. To solve this issue of poverty, we must take, tackle this issue at its root. Having to repay this debt will put pressure on the governments to, to support their countries and therefore improving healthcare and infrastructure in their countries. I believe that essentially, by allowing this debt relief, we were not, we're not going to spark the motivation needed for the governments to help support their countries and to relieve their countries from this poverty. Thank you. Right. Young man here in the white top. Would um, putting money into education, for example, learners, the people our age, could be the future politicians, future businesses that change the situation in these countries? International businesses could also help from the economic situations in these countries. Thank and you. your name and school, please. Uh, Ethan Scott, Okanagan Academy. Right, young ladies here on the left of the two girls there. Yes, my left. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I am Freya Nicholl from Dumbleina High. The proposition said that we should be ashamed of ourselves. Surely it is not our fault that places like Zambia have put themselves in so much debt. We are only asking for the money that was borrowed. We should not be ashamed that we are taking money back that was borrowed from us. Thank you. And I'll take uh, on you go then, Sean, very briefly. I want um, to get everyone I in. I would argue that by taking this debt, we should be ashamed of ourselves because by taking the debt and taking the money away, we're essentially taking food away from the mouths of poverty-stricken people in these countries. By allowing them to, by cancelling the debt and allowing them to keep the money, they can focus on providing for their people rather than having to provide us with money that really we can technically afford to lose. Right, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to allow any more contributions from the opposition or proposition speakers. Uh, gentlemen, there on the right, on the right, um, or, or, have you um, not spoken already, no? No, I haven't. No? You can go. Go on then. Uh, my name is Luke McVie and I'm a pupil at St Morris's High School and this is for the opposition. To argue from the perspective of the Commonwealth, in order for the Commonwealth to truly thrive, there cannot be any weak countries within it, as weak countries does indeed equal a weak Commonwealth. Uh, surely in order for the Commonwealth to thrive, these countries are required to grow and develop. However, they cannot, as their growth and develop is somewhat halted by these debts that they need to pay. May I remind you that the original debt has actually been paid off and the rest now is pure profit. This not only makes the country this not only mocks the country itself or the global reputation of the Commonwealth, but the mo but the models the morals of the Commonwealth as a whole. Microphone gets to you. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm Helena Wilson from Dumbling High School. I asked the proposition. Why do they believe that alternative method, methods of helping developing Commonwealth countries are not as effective as completely writing off their debt? Right. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet who wants to make a point? If so, put your hand up now or forever hold your peace. I can't see anyone. So I think we'll draw this part of these proceedings to a close. Now, uh, and so I would again thank you all for all your contributions, and I think I'm very pleased that everyone who has wanted to speak has managed to speak. That's very, very important in an institution such as this, as I'm sure you will understand. So I'd now like to ask Izzy to reply on behalf of the opposition. Izzy, you have three minutes, please. 
Deputy Presiding Official, Members of the House, first I'd like to focus on the moral aspect of this argument, because the proposition have allowed the issue to become emotionally charged. Writing off debt sounds kind, but as we've pointed out, it's, it's really a very ineffective way to go about uh, reducing poverty. Um, they're very keen to establish the moral high ground and have focused on the heart of the argument, but economics shouldn't be led by the heart. Um, we need sound policies um, and not just kind thoughts. It seems that writing off debt in the past and in the proposition's proposals is a way of displacing our guilt for the third world. We are right to be guilty and we need to do something to help, but this isn't an effective way. In fact, it's a relatively cheap way because as they pointed out, um, you know, the, someone in the floor debate pointed out, we've had most of the money paid back already and it's just interest. It's a cheap way of assert asserting our moral legitimacy when really we need to be focusing on the needs of the developing world. Um, so another point that's been raised a lot is the problem of odious debt. And we agree what we've done in the past has not always been the right thing. But simply writing debt off without any acknowledgement of this or putting things in place to stop the same thing happening again is not going to help the problem. As recently as last year, we lent to Kenya, I believe it was, after a member of their economics department of the government had just defected to the West and said that the government at the highest level, the Prime Minister, was embezzling funds, and yet we went ahead with this donation. Um, so clearly we need to straighten this out in Western countries as well as in the developing world. And if we do need to sort out odious debt, then we should focus on odious debt, not do a blanket debt cancellation, which is something of a scattergun approach and hope for the best, hope it will work, without actually looking into individual countries and their needs. Um, One minute. The second proposition, I believe, um, spoke about a vicious cycle of debt and that cancelling debt would allow countries to break out of this, when in fact it's the opposite. Simply reducing the debt without doing anything to change the underlying problems is going to lead to a vicious cycle of debt building up again. Um, in the HIPC scheme, Uganda and Bolivia had their debts cancelled, and yet they rose to unsustainable levels within a year because the underlying problems had not been fixed cancelling debt won't change the underlying problems. They need to have access to credit markets, proper financial institutions, um, property rights and laws to make investment more attractive. Moreover, uh, many Commonwealth countries don't even record their debt, so if you try to find St Kitts and Nevis's debt, you really can't because they don't know, they, they don't have figures. And we need to focus on this problem before we write off debt and the same problems will occur again. Um, the the point of aid and investment is that writing off debt, particularly when it's unsustainable, creates hypothetical money that would have been paid otherwise, but it's not real capital that is very clearly defined and they can invest in projects. Must wind up now, it floats please. in the economic ether and will not lead to substantial social benefits. So again, vote opposition. Thank you, Izzy. And I now call on David to reply for the proposition. David, you too have three minutes. Deputy Presiding Officer, Honour Judges, ladies and gentlemen, we, the proposition, three, see three main stages of conflict in this debate tonight. The first of these is regarding economics. Now, the opposition argue that much of the debt owed by nations in the Commonwealth is not for fellow nations in the Commonwealth, and therefore cancelling this debt would be not effective. But I disagree with this. I disagree with this in terms that it is a start for these countries to get rid of money that they clearly cannot afford to pay back. And it's a start because the benefits that would come from cancelling this debt are invaluable to the countries to whom it concerns. It makes them more attractive trading partners, as I said in my first speech. And that's not an argument purely of the heart. That is an argument purely of the head and a common sense argument. The opposition also argued that cancelling this debt will not help the poor of these nations. However, clearly it will, because it's extra money that these countries do not need to worry about paying back. And therefore, these countries can focus on addressing issues within their nations, such as health, such as education, such as their general infrastructure, which ultimately will filter down to the poor of those nations. The opposition also said the underlying causes would not be solved by cancelling the debt. They say that countries will go back into more debt. However, we have highlighted various examples of where odious debt within the Commonwealth has been the cause of that debt in the first place. Dictators have built up this debt. Dictators that have run the country and destroyed the lives of people within those nations. We look at the likes of the apartheid regime and we see it's 
unfair that the likes of Nelson Mandela had to pay back the debt of the dictators who ran before him. We need to learn from the mistakes of events such as the Treaty of Versailles, and we saw what damage it caused by leaving countries with debt that they couldn't afford to pay back. Current regimes are nations which are untested in paying back debt. We need to give them a new chance, a clean slate and a fresh start in these tough economic times. One minute. But more importantly, we owe it to the people of these developing nations to do something, even if it is a small start, as the opposition point out. When it boils down to it, it's about helping the people of these nations. It's about making a start to tackling inequalities by helping them to address issues such as health and education and general infrastructure. It's about stimulating trade within the Commonwealth, and it's about improving the lives of those within the organisation. It's about both a head and a heart approach to this argument, and that's why I urge you to support the motion proposed to you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And thank you all for your contributions to this debate. It's been absolutely fascinating, and I'm certain we could carry on debating for hours to come. However, I now have to ask the judges to adjourn and decide who will win this year's debating tournament. An incredibly difficult task. And I'll just remind them that they have until 9.20 to complete this task. Thank you. And it now gives me a great pleasure to announce the winner of the Scottish Parliament and the Law Society of Scotland essay competition. The new lawyers essay competition was open to all final and penultimate LLB students in Scotland and collects the views of promising future lawyers and politicians in Scotland. All participants were asked to submit an essay in no more than 2,000 words on which act of the Scottish Parliament passed in the second year, 2012-13, of session four will have the biggest effect on Scots law and why. And I'd now like to invite Alistair Morris, President of the Law Society of Scotland, to join me in presenting the prize. I'm reliably informed that the standard of essays this year was once again extremely high. And I'm delighted to announce that David Gallagher, a law student from the University of Edinburgh, has been chosen as the winner. David, can I ask you to come onto the floor to receive your prize, which is a £500 cash prize from the Law Society of Scotland and a three-week paid work placement in the Solicitor's Office of the Scottish Parliament. I would also like to invite you all to join me in the garden lobby for a short reception after the presentation and ask that all guests be seated back in the chamber by 9.25. Please could I ask those on the chamber floor to remain seated until instructed to leave by a member of the events team. Thank you.